Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2024 Longbow Key Disaster Preparedness Seminar. My name is Kim Veralt, and I am honored to serve as the president of the Longbow Key Chamber of Commerce. Today's important event is brought to you by the Town of Longbow Key and the Longbow Key Chamber of Commerce with the aim of ensuring our community is well prepared for any emergency weather event we may face in the future. I would like to extend a special thanks to our presenting sponsor, sponsor Finch Roof Consulting, for their generous support. If you haven't already, be sure to visit their table later today to sign up for a complimentary roof inspection. Our gratitude also goes out to our prize sponsor, Right Way Emergency Services. They have contributed five well-stocked disaster preparedness kits, which will be raffled off at the end of the program. We are also truly grateful for the resort at Longbow Key Club for hosting this event and providing all of us today with complimentary hors d'oeuvres and refreshments. We also appreciate Publix for their contributions of today's goodie bags, along with the consistently excellent advertising and reporting by The Observer, which has helped to spread the word about this seminar and other current information to our area residents and businesses. In addition, I would like to take a moment to recognize and thank all the event exhibitors in the room today whose businesses are centered around disaster preparedness. Your expertise and resources are invaluable to our community. I encourage everyone to visit each exhibitor at the end of the program if you haven't already met with them. To round out today's thank yous, this event would not be possible without the hard work and ded dedication of many individuals. Thank you to the employees of the Town of Longbow Key, including Susan Phillips, Town Manager Howard Tipton, our Commissioners, Mayor Ken Schneier, Chief Desi, the Disaster Preparedness Committee, the Chamber staff, and volunteers. Your commitment is deeply appreciated. For those unable to attend in person today, we are pleased to announce that this event is being video recorded. Please contact the Longboat Key Chamber of Commerce Monday through Friday for more information on how to obtain the recording or fill out the video form that was on your chair and deposit it in the box in the foyer. It is crucial that we disseminate this important information widely to ensure all area residents and businesses are well informed. Today's seminar will feature a panel of experts who will collectively educate us on how to pr prepare for and stay safe during emergency weather events. We are fortunate to have incredibly knowledgeable professionals with us and I am confident you will find their insights to be invaluable. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that Rightway Emergency Services has generously provided fantastic prizes that will be raffled at the end of the program. Remember, you must be present to win, so we encourage you to stay until the conclusion of the program. Finally, it is my pleasure to introduce Mayor Ken Schneier, we are grateful for his attendance and support. Mayor Schneier will share a few words about disaster preparedness and will introduce our distinguished panel of speakers. Thank you for all being here today. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Ken Schneider. So thank you, Kim. Uh, from the size of the audience today, I suspect all you folks have been watching the weather reports. Uh, only tickets to Hamilton have sold out more quickly. 
So if, I hope you can find standing room if you can't find a seat. On behalf of the town of Longbow Key, I want to welcome you to our annual Hurricane Preparedness Program. As we experience the combined effects of sea level rise and more extreme weather, it's crucial that we increase our vigilance and reemphasize that our plan for major storm events is critical. We've had several near misses in recent years, and even these have had severe impacts on portions of our island. So please listen carefully to the experts on today's panel follow their advice, and in the case of a storm, follow their instructions. I would like to echo Kim's thanks to the many people and organizations that have made this event possible. Special thanks go, I would say, to Kim Veralt herself in her first year as Longbow Key Chamber of Commerce President, and to Paul Desi, our longtime Longbow Key Fire Chief and Emergency Director. This is a major effort for an important purpose. So it's now my privilege to introduce our panel in the order that they will present. Uh, I will give you their name and their title and their subject, and I would just ask each of you, when I say your name, raise your hand so the audience can put a, a face to a name. First, our keynote speaker is Brian Lamar. He's a meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service Tampa Bay Area and NOAA Gulf of Mexico Regional Collaboration Team. His topic will be predictions for the upcoming, upcoming hurricane season and the importance of hurricane preparations. Second is Sandra Tapfumene, Emergency Management Chief of Sarasota County. She will talk about evacuations and evacuation center resources. Uh, Sandra has told me that she is recently from Lee County and therefore has unfortunately quite a bit of experience in this area. Uh, next is Matthew Myers, Emergency Management, Management Chief of Manatee County. As most of you, if not all of you know, Longbow Key is situated in both counties, Manatee and Sarasota. His topic will be business and personal preparedness. Next is uh, Bob Harrigan, ABC TV Chief Meteorologist who will discuss local weather, where we have a star, we have a star at present. Uh, next will be Colby Gason, BACVB Marketing and Communications Director, to discuss effective, effectively communicating to visitors and tourists. And finally, last but not least, our Deputy Police Chief, Frank Rubino, who will discuss the critical issue of re-entry onto Lombok Key if there's an evacuation. So welcome all the presenters and um, <laughs> and Brian you're up. All right, good afternoon everybody. Let me bring this up here. Uh, definitely a large crowd, really glad that you're all out here. Uh, hurricane season is something that uh, definitely means a lot to me. Uh, I've worked for the National Weather Service for 30 years now, coming up in July, and each year there's always something that happens that has a significant impact on, on the lives of many. I grew up in Connecticut, uh, so to let you know, anyone from Connecticut here? Oh, wow. That's, fa that's fantastic. You come all the way to Florida and meet someone from Connecticut. And uh, started uh, my career up there, up in Hartford, Connecticut, as a volunteer uh, while I was still in college. Uh, that was in 92. Uh, not long after Hurricane Andrew had impacted South Florida. And I moved around the country with the National Weather Service uh, to Corpus Christi, Texas, Lubbock, Texas, Washington, D.C., and been in charge of the weather office uh, up the road in Ruskin since 2007. So what I want to do is kind of go over several different aspects of the hurricane season, what occurred already. You're going to see some names uh, that are going to stick out to you, a lot of hurricanes that impacted this area over the years. And then I'm going to talk about, you know, what are we looking at for this year? And I'll give you a sneak preview. It's expected to be above normal, and I'll talk about why. And I'll talk about what that also does not mean, because there's a lot of folks out there that get very anxious, very fearful over hurricanes. And yes, they're, they're, they're horrific. You know, we, we can think just to a couple of years ago, uh, just south of here, but ju just know that we can survive a hurricane. Anyone can. And it's just about listening to evacuation orders and getting out of its way. It, it truly is as simple as that. 
uh, but I'll talk about a lot of the devastating hurricanes. So you can see the one on the screen up here. This is Hurricane Ian, and this is a satellite picture uh, that my agency has. Uh, it's located about 22,300 miles above our heads. And we have a satellite on the east coast of the United States, and we have one on the west coast of the United States. And this one is zooming in, and it's right uh, when Hurricane Ian was about to make landfall. And this was uh, September 28th, uh, 2022, and 3.05 p.m. Uh, when it made landfall, the first landfall. And an hour and a half later, at 4.35 p.m., it made the second landfall on Punta Gorda. You can see the flashes around the eye. That's actually lightning. So our satellite is able to see uh, lightning flashes within the cloud. And we don't normally see lightning in a lot of hurricanes. Uh, they're what we call a warm core system. Lightning, you need some cold air, you need friction, ice crystals rubbing up against each other, hailstones, something you don't think about a lot with hurricanes. But with the most powerful, the most intense hurricanes, what we call very strong updrafts or rising air, you get lightning that forms. And it typically means the storm is actually getting stronger. You may have heard Hurricane Ian was a Category 5. Uh, around the time of this satellite image uh, before it made landfall as a Category 4. And, and you'll never hear me say, and hopefully no other meteorologist say, uh, a week, the word week before either a tropical storm, a hurricane, it doesn't matter if it's a Category 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, uh, none of them should be ever thought of as weak because they can still do significant damage. But stepping through uh, some of the I think I just blacked it out. Stepping through some of the information, you know, looking at the past couple of years, uh, NOAA, the agency I work for, uh, tabulates uh, what we call billion dollar disasters. And these are weather and climate events. You'll see on the screen, there's blizzards, there's wildfires, there's flash floods, there's hurricanes, there's tornado outbreaks, which we saw a lot of this year. And you'll see on the bottom right, Hurricane Nicole on the east coast of, of the state, and of course, Hurricane Ian. Now, Hurricane Ian, uh, the impact to economy was over about $135 billion. So each of these, you see 18 different disasters on this map. Each of them produced over a billion. So again, Hurricane Ian was over $134 billion. Now, looking at last year, those 18 different disasters increased to 28 different disasters. Now, you may remember the name Adalia, Last year, Hurricane Adalia impacted Florida, made landfall in Dixie County, uh, in Wheaton Beach, uh, to the north of Cedar Key. My office covers Cedar Key down to Bonita Springs, inland to Polk and Highlands County. And so Adalia was just north of us, but as you know here, the entire west coast of Florida had flooding, uh, even right outside you know, these windows from Hurricane Adalia. Hurricane Adalia was about 130 miles west of us, where we are sitting right now, and produced that type of flooding. So again, a tropical storm or hurricane does not have to make landfall in your area in order to produce significant damages. Now, looking at the entire Gulf of Mexico, you know, a friend of mine at the Weather Channel put this together, and what we did is we pulled off the Category 3, Category 4, and Category 5 hurricanes. Those are what we consider major. It doesn't mean how bad, it just means major like on the wind speed. Anything greater than about 130 miles per hour is a Category 3. And you see many different names on that map, right? You see the ones in Texas, Hurricane Harvey in 2017, the same year we had Hurricane Irma. And not on this map, but Hurricane Maria, uh, same year, hit Puerto Rico and uh, killed over 3,000 people. I'll say that again, 3,000 people lost their life in Hurricane Maria. Uh, so again, these storms mean business. And you'll hear me also talk about rapid intensification. It's when these storms, well, as it says, rapidly intensify. So it gets strong very fast. And I'll show it coming up on the next slide. This slide right here is really looking at what actually occurred last year. So this is you know, 2023. And you can see all of the lines uh, over the ocean, right? Most of them, not all, because you can see a dahlia uh, that kind of moved up in the Yucatan Peninsula and moved over you know, the west coast of Florida. But on the top right, I put some numbers. So you can see the 20 named storms. That's how many storms actually formed last year. Seven of those 20 became hurricanes. Okay? And out of the seven, three became major. So again, category three, four, or five. Now to the right of that, in parentheses, I put some numbers. So the 14, seven, and three. That's what we should see every single year. On average, we should see 14 storms, seven hurricanes, and three major, okay? That's a normal year. Now, 
Any hands for Hurricane Andrew? Anyone live in Florida in 1992? So, well, more people are from Connecticut than actually lived in, <laughs> lived in Florida in 1982. Um, that's good to see. But uh, so Hurricane Andrew, 1992, that was a below normal year. We had seven total storms the entire year of 1992. And the very first storm, it was a late starting season, happened in August. Letter A, that's Andrew, and you know, well, we all know what it did. It, it uh, destroyed a lot of southeast Florida, and some communities didn't rebuild. You know, and a lot of building codes were formed because of Hurricane Andrew and the impacts that it had. So again, that was a below normal year in 1992. This year, we're actually looking at about double the average number. So we're looking at up to about 25, 26 named storms, up to about 14 or 15 hurricanes, and up to about six or seven major hurricanes. So yes, it's going to be a hyperactive season. The conditions are there. The warm water in the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico is actually much warmer than it should be this time of year. You know, I was, I was out around our, our 15 counties uh, starting in March, and back then I was saying the water temperatures in March were what they would normally be in July. So we're seeing a much warmer atmosphere, and, and we're seeing something called La Nina. So you heard of El Nino and La Nina. Well, we're out of El Nino now, and we're going into a La Nina pattern. And what does that mean? La Nina usually means we have less wind, wind shear, strong winds over the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico. Strong winds tend to disrupt hurricanes and storms from forming. We like El Nino years for that reason. It doesn't mean we'll have zero storms, but usually it, it reduces the number. But this year, we're getting more into La Nina. It's going to get stronger uh, during August, September, and October, unfortunately, because that's our peak hurricane season. But I want you to know that it, it does not mean we're going to get landfalls every single week you know, during the hurricane season. You know that as well as I do. That, that's not realistic. But the greater the number of storms we see, obviously, the, the chances go up that we may see something in our area. And for Sarasota County, for all of the west coast of Florida, we have to treat every year as the year you know, that we may see a hurricane. And, and this chart right here, I got it from uh, Mike Brennan. He's the new director of the Hurricane Center in Miami. And he showed this when we were together in West Palm Beach at the Florida Governor's Hurricane Conference uh, earlier last month. But what I did is I took his slide and I put in red uh, the names of uh, four storms. And you can see it was a 1935 Labor Day hurricane that hit the Florida Keys. 1969, Hurricane Camille, that hit New Orleans area. We already talked about Hurricane Andrew, 1992, that hit Florida and also Louisiana. And then 2018, Hurricane Michael. So what's special about these four storms? Well, these four storms were the last four to ever make landfall in the United States as a Category 5. So these were the last four that made landfall as a Category 5. And I bring that up because three days before they made landfall as a Category 5, they were tropical storms, about 50 or 60 miles per hour. So you can see that's where we talk about rapid intensification. You know, when it comes to evacuation orders, that is a nightmare. When you have a rapid intensifying storm, such as Ian, such as Irma, such as Michael, and you're trying to get people to leave an area with a very shorter window of opportunity. So again, that's even more reason to make sure that you listen to folks you know, here and elsewhere that are making the decisions for evacuation orders. They don't do it to scare us. They do it to save our lives. And that's why we're all here today. But looking on this, uh, take a glance at the names. I'm going to ask anyone here, is your name on this map? That's a lot. Hopefully, let's see, any, any hands raised? Uh, so you can see the names. So these are the names that we will be using this year. Must be a lot of names on this list. Uh, one thing I'll say here is hopefully uh, your name is not retired because in order for us to pull your name from the list, it means that there's been a lot of destruction. You know, that we will never see another Hurricane Ian or Andrew or Michael or Katrina or Rita or Wilma. You know, there's so many of them. But we have six different lists that we rotate through every six year. And a perfect example of June of 2012, okay? Most, a lot, probably a lot of folks here, June of 2012, you were living here. Uh, we had a tropical storm, not a hurricane, a tropical storm named Debbie, okay? And Debbie hit this area, produced a lot of tornadoes, a lot of wind, a lot of rain. It killed a woman in Highlands County. Uh, it was horrific. And you see that name on, on this list again. So every six years, you know, 2020, uh, 2000, 
I had a math error there. So 19, uh, 2012 and 2018 and, and so forth. But you can see 2024, Debbie's back on the list. Isaac is on this list. Uh, it was off Tampa Bay. It was off here in uh, 2012 as well. Uh, we had the Republican National Convention in town in Tampa, and I was at the convention center doing national interviews with CNN and Fox News and telling people Isaac is getting stronger, and they canceled the first day of the uh, convention as Isaac became a hurricane and moved towards Louisiana. So again, these are the names that you're going to hear. And some people will ask, what happens when we run out of names? <laughs> we don't, it may happen this year, but uh, we never like to do that. But there's 21 letters on this list. You know, we have 26 letters of the alphabet. We don't use Q, U, X, Y, or Z, because not many names start with those letters. And we used to go to the Greek alphabet. But after 2020 and 2022, we stopped doing that. Uh, because of COVID, uh, there were actually COVID variants that had Greek names like Delta and Omicron. And we don't want a massive COVID hurricane that's you know, impacting the area. <laughs> but looking at the 2024 hurricane season, you can see the orange 85%. That tells you it's 85% chance that we will be above normal. We have never had an outlook that had so many numbers. Okay, so again, does it all mean they're gonna hit land? No but we have to prepare as if we're going to see one this year. Now this is Hurricane Ian. This is the radar from my office in Ruskin and it can see all across the area. I know Bob was showing this, Sandra and I were talking about this, Paul and I. Um, this is something that we never want to see, okay? And this is the eye of Hurricane Ian making landfall over Charlotte and Lee counties. And typically when you see a hurricane make landfall, the center is what we're tracking, okay? And I'm gonna talk about that famous cone uh, that a lot of people get confused over, including meteorologists. Uh, we'll talk about that, but that cone really is telling you where the center of the storm will be, that eye, where is the center going to go? But with big storms, the impacts are usually well outside that center. You know, we had over hurricane force winds up in Tampa from this storm, and the center was 125 miles away from us. And you can see on this map, these are the wind gusts. So again, 77, I know it's hard to see for some folks in the room, um, it's hard for me to see on the laptop here, but uh, over 150 mile an hour winds uh, down in portions of southwest Florida and a lot of significant damage just from the wind. And looking at the storm surge, you know, this water is the number one threat, you know, the number one killer when it comes to hurricanes. That could be storm surge, that could be inland flooding. So the main thing is, you know, run from the water, hide from the wind, you know, the famous phrase, so get out of the way when it comes to storm surge. That's what evacuation orders are for. So elected officials, emergency managers, they, they issue evacuation orders to save lives, not to scare people, not to make it an inconvenience for someone to get out of the area. It's to save your life. I was up in Citrus County uh, in March uh, speaking with the, um, the county board of uh, commissioners, and I heard stories from uh, people from the public that went through Hurricane Adalia, and, and, and there were complaints, I'll be honest with you. Uh, anyone here from Citrus County? Okay, so I'll share some things that were private up there. Uh, there, were, there were some complaints from, from folks in the public that were upset that they had to leave the area and they came back uh, to their home. Um, and I, I actually like hearing those stories. I like it a lot. I, those folks weren't happy when I told them that, but the main thing is you got to go home. You know, you got to go to your home and it was not damaged. It was still there. You know, folks on this panel right here know folks that did not survive, did not get to go home, did not have family members to go home to, and so keep that in mind, you know, it, it is a good day if you evacuate and you, and it's a bust, you know, maybe the forecast, the track shifted a little bit, that's good news, okay, that is very good news. Um, looking at the rainfall, again, uh, some people uh, lost their life farther inland because of heavy rain, so we tell people, you know, your hurricane kit, you know, this may sound strange, but you, you may need to bring an ax with you, you know, into your attic. You know, we've told folks a chainsaw, you know, we get some of the stairs, like, what do you mean by that? You know, and Hurricane Ian was similar, Hurricane Arby in Houston, uh, people were being rescued from off their roofs, and they were only able to get to their roof because they could chainsaw or ax themselves out of their attic. Think about that, the water gets that high in your home, and so you want to make sure you are not in your home when that happens. You want to get out of the area. So again, these are real life stories and, and I'm sparing some of the, the really horrific stories that I know get me choked up and get other folks choked up on this panel uh, from when we did you know, surveys down in Charlotte and Lee County and heard and saw the worst. But the cone, I want to spend a little bit of time 
just looking at the, the time here, uh, the cone of uncertainty, as we call it. There's a lot of names for this. I won't say them all, but uh, the cone itself really just tells you, again, where the center of the storm will be. So there's equal chances for that center, the eye, to be on the right-hand side of the cone as it is for the left-hand side. So it's about 35% chance on the left, 35% chance on the right. It's about a 75% chance in the middle, okay? That's what the cone means, but it tells you absolutely nothing where the heavy rain will be where the killer storm surge will be, where the flooding will be, or where the strong winds will be. This only tells you where the center will be. And looking at an example, this was Hurricane Ian's cone at one time when the center was going up towards Apalachicola area. There's the cone. Southwest Florida never left the right-hand side of the cone, but I can truly, I, I feel for people that were focusing on the center and they see, oh, it's going up towards Tampa, we're, we're feeling better here. But again, the cone just tells you where the center will go. That's where the strongest wind was. Remember I showed that map, okay, on the far right-hand side. This is where the heavy rainfall, in excess of two feet of rainfall in some examples. And the killer storm surge, that narrow band. The storm surge will always be on the right-hand side of where the center will be. So if you know where the center is going, you know, think of that radar image where the eye was rotating and going towards Lee County and Charlotte County. The storm surge will be to the right of that, okay? It's not going to be the left of it. You guys lost water. You know, the, the water drained out of this area. You know, Tampa Bay lost about six or seven feet of water. Uh, so again, the right-hand side of the storm is usually the most ferocious when it comes to these types of weather systems. Now this is interesting because I show, uh, I was doing some media interviews uh, not long after Hurricane Ian and I would say, when does, you know, 25 miles, or what was it? Yeah, when does 20 miles equal 125 miles? And that's on the left-hand side. And like I said earlier, from uh, you know, Tampa to Fort Myers is about 125 miles. If Hurricane Ian had just shifted just a little bit, 20 miles, okay? You know, I drove down here from Ruskin, a lot more than 20 miles. If it had just shifted a little bit, that track would have been up in Tampa Bay. And it would have put this area underwater. Because if, again, remember the right-hand side of the storm. So if a landfall goes into Tampa Bay, Sarasota is going to get a tremendous amount of water under most cases. And again, look at, look at 25 miles shift goes up to Cedar Key. So again, the, the, the challenge with Florida is that we have a north-south coastline, and so any little shift, 5, 10, 15, 20 miles, it means the world of difference when it comes to impacts. Now one thing, I'll zoom in here, uh, the cone, we're actually going to be adding uh, a little bit onto it this year. We're going to be showing where are the inland wind warnings are. And trust me, I know the cone is confusing. Uh, <laughs> It, it confuses a lot of folks, and it is going to be changing in the future. Uh, right now, it's being e uh, evolved by the National Hurricane Center. So you can see the cone. We want people to focus less on the actual cone and more on the impacts. And looking at you know how people get into the most trouble, you know, lose their life when it comes to hurricanes. This isn't about one hurricane in specific. This is looking at hurricanes from 2013 to 2022, and and you can see you know some. Popular states here, right? You can see Florida, there's a spike. You got New Jersey, North Carolina, you have Texas, all of those big coastal states, uh, which makes sense. And, you know, a lot of it is going to be water. So, again, like I said earlier, water is the number one killer when it comes to hurricanes and tropical storms. Now, indirect fatalities, what does that mean? That means how do people lose their life after the storm, okay? And we're actually seeing a shift now with more people are losing their life after the storm. You know, years ago, it was always right when the storm is making landfall, and that, that still happens, obviously, but we're seeing the numbers decrease because more people are listening to evacuation orders, more people are understanding how dangerous it is. But after the storm, carbon monoxide poisoning, you know, think of a generator. You know, we heard from family members that said, you know, my uncle had a generator, he didn't want it stolen, and you could probably fill in the rest of the sentence. He brought the generator inside his house and carbon monoxide poisoning. So this happens every storm. And so, you know, please bring, bring that message home with you and tell it to people that can't be here. Uh, but also, you know, medical issues, heart attack, things like that. Uh, again, looking at Hurricane Ian, again, remember I talked about that, that chainsaw and that, that axe. You know, look at the home on the bottom left. You know, the water is up to the roof line. And on the right-hand side, that's Highway 70 in Arcadia. They don't have beaches in Arcadia. This was heavy rainfall, and people lost their life in that area. Now, I spoke to a woman, I don't know where she is right now, on the walk in, and uh, we were talking about two different storms, 
and uh, Hurricane Charlie and Hurricane Ian. And you can see uh, the differences. So on the left-hand side, Hurricane Charlie, uh, Friday the 13th, August 2004, made landfall at the exact same location where Hurricane Ian made landfall, Cayo Costa, Fort Myers Beach. And Charlie was a much smaller storm, okay? They were both category four storms. So again, forget the category. It's, it's information for you to know about wind speed, but it isn't the whole picture, okay? Charlie was a category four. It produced about six or seven feet of storm surge in Charlotte Harbor. Hurricane Ian was a category four hurricane. It produced 10 to 15 feet of storm surge. I went down there, I was down there with Sandra and her team. I measured personally 15.4 feet of storm surge with Fort Myers Beach, you know, and again, that was a category four. But as I wrap up here, uh, I talked about Hurricane Adalia. This is the satellite image and loop of Hurricane Adalia as it was moving northward uh, during the last uh, few days of August last year, just 11 months after Hurricane Ian made landfall. So again, there was a lot of folks wondering, okay, I've got three or four feet of water, you know, here, is this, you know, gonna be like Hurricane Ian? And we told folks, no, this will not be like Hurricane Ian, but you're going to see some water coming up into your area. So the little, uh, oh, I think it's on this slide here, this one right here, uh, we showed some pictures and I drew like points off our coast. So let's see, uh, Sarasota, 126 miles to the west. You had about, you know, three to four feet of water here. And look at Tampa underwater there, Bayshore Boulevard, Punta Gorda had water, Cedar Key had water. So this storm was over 100 miles west of us and yet we had this. So again, keep that in mind, and lastly, I'll leave you with this. If you don't have this on your phone, it's free. Uh, the National Weather Service worked with FEMA to create an app. You can download it from your phone or have a relative put it on your phone, and you can put in like Sarasota County, Manti County, Charlotte County, whatever you like, and you'll get alerts uh, when we issue certain warnings. And I know Bob's team uh, with ABC Sarasota also has alerts, and also Sarasota County Office of Emergency Management also has alerts. Uh, definitely get many of them. Redundancy is good when it comes to getting this information. So having that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? No. Did we touch something? Let's try it again. Is that better? Okay, very good. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me here. It is great to see so many people that are interested in being prepared for uh, the next potential storm that might come to our area. Uh, my name is Sandra Tapfumine, um, and uh, Mayor Schneider, right? Did I uh, say your name right? He said my name right, so I'm so impressed. Very good, very good. Most people call me Sandra T, so thank you for that. Um, so I'm new to Sarasota County. I just started January 2nd of this year. I was the emergency management chief down in Lee County um, and was with that team for about 12 years. Um, I had been in emergency management for about 20 years. So I'm, I have certainly had a massive experience, not that I had asked for it necessarily, but being down in Lee County, we had a number of tremendous storms come through. Um, Hurricane Irma and then of course um, our category four Hurricane Ian, and we're going to talk about some of those impacts today from a very personal level um, because as Brian was saying, that storm nearly came here, right, a couple of days before it was targeted to hit this area, and um, you guys were very fortunate that it continued to head south, and so I want to make sure that you just are really, really clear about the risk. Um, we all come to Florida, most of us at least, because we love the beautiful weather and we love the beautiful ocean but that comes with a level of risk. And so, and Brian put it really well, the great thing about hurricanes is that you know when they're coming and you can get out of their way. Um, I'm from the Midwest, and what are we concerned about in the Midwest? Tornadoes, tornadoes right? Oftentimes you don't get a lot of warning with tornadoes. So um, not that I love the destruction that these hurricanes cause, but at least we can warn people. And so we're gonna talk about that today. 
Um, but first, um, Chief Desi did want me to talk just a little bit about the structure of disaster management in the, in the country, how it affects us here locally. So every emergency begins and ends locally. And what does that mean? That means that we have people in place, people like Matt and I. It's actually a state statute that every county in Florida have an emergency management director and a program in place to be able to work towards making sure that we are prepared to respond to and recover from any kind of an emergency or large-scale disaster. Today we're talking about hurricanes because uh, it's the start of the season, but Matt and I work year-round on all kinds of different hazards, including uh, you know, any kind of tornado that might come our way, any kind of flooding event, wildfires, pandemics, terrorism um, events, anything that might impact us and, and interrupt normal services at the county or city levels. So just to let you know, we have 67 of those programs across the state and we work and our job is to coordinate with all the municipalities within our counties. And that's why Matt and I work really closely with Chief Desi and his team here in the town to make sure that we are, uh, we know each other very well, our plans are interlinked, and that's what you see in that, that first box. We've got the incident that happens in red, and then it goes to local response. So we try to manage everything here locally with our first responders, our nonprofit agencies, our private sector, individuals and residents, anybody in the community, right, that's involved with that, with that effort. If we need help, if we don't have enough resources or we need additional support, then we go to the state. And the state of Florida has an emergency operations center and a team up in Tallahassee who are very well prepared to come in and help us. They sent us a tremendous and just an a influx of resources down uh, in Lee County for Hurricane Ian. Um, and it was really a good feeling to know that if we can't handle things here locally, we have that huge, tremendous support. And then what happens if the state of Florida runs out of resources? Well, then the state of Florida has an agreement in place with the rest of the states in the country, and they can call on other teams to come in and help. And then we have, of course, you know, federal resources on top of that if the states don't have enough to support. So you see different levels of uh, resources and capability, and that's, again, what Matt and I do year-round is to make sure we have good structures in place, we have a good organization, we're working with our municipalities. That way we can try to get the county back up and running as quickly as possible so that you can return home and we can do the best we can to get back to normal life. So during disasters, just a little more information, Matt and I both run emergency operations centers out, um, ours is located off of Cattleman Road, close to I-75, and we actually um, each have seats, uh, well, I'll let Matt talk for himself, we have a seat for a municipality, uh, you do as well, okay, a liaison from the town who actually comes and sits in our emergency operations center. And, and who that, is, that, that whole center is designed to have every representative that you can think of across the county that needs to make big decisions, things like closure of government, closure of schools, how are we um, assessing where all the damages are so that we can send out resources to the, most, the hardest hit areas and prioritize you know, who is gonna get those resources first if they're scarce. We're working on being the liaison to all of those teams that we talked about um, to the state and to FEMA um, and to all of the different resources that will be coming our way to assist. And really important also is that we're talking with one voice. I think it would be pretty confusing for you if you were getting conflicting information from all over the place as to what you know, you're supposed to be doing, when the storm is gonna hit, what resources are available. So we work, um, our team has a, a great team of public information officers who work with the media, um, like Bob and his group um, over at ABC7. We work with all of the different media outlets and we're, they're sending out information, updating websites so that you have the right information at your fingertips. Um, so that's all happening, and we're going to talk about evacuations and mass care services because that's something else really important that our center does. So let's get right to it. Why do we evacuate? And, um, you know, Brian touched on this when he was talking already. You know, these storms have the potential to bring a tremendous amount of water, and that storm surge, that abnormal rise of water that's pushed up onto land is really the main reason that we would call for an evacuation. 
If you haven't noticed, we are extremely flat with low elevation in this county. And you in particular are on a barrier island, right? Not a lot of elevation out here. And um, truly, even if, and, and Pine Island is a great example of that, there was a whole like elevated area in the middle of the island. Um, and as we talk to people down there over the years, they're like, we're gonna run to that elevated point, you know, and not evacuate. And, we always encourage people that is not a great idea, right? Because you become a smaller island, essentially. essentially you know, that, that's the potential to happen. Uh, we don't want people stranded. And so as we are getting information from the National Hurricane Center about potential uh, depth of the storm surge that is coming our way, and then we are working with um, Brian and his team at the National Weather Service to understand, okay, well, what does that mean for us here? And what does that mean for Longboat Key? What can they expect? then we are taking that information, we're overlaying it onto the county so that we know, well, how far inland do we need to evacuate? Because at the end of the day, we don't want anyone contending with the water that could come up on the land. It is so very dangerous. We would also evacuate for people that live in manufactured homes, mobile homes, RVs, and boats. Um, but um, really for you out here, truly it is mainly the storm surge that we are very concerned about. And the next thing I'm about to say is the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. So please do not make decisions based on your experience with the last storm or the last two storms that have come and threatened this area. If you catch yourself or your neighbor or someone at the grocery store telling you, well, last time during Hurricane Ian, it wasn't that bad, you know, I either evacuated or I didn't evacuate and nothing happened, right? That is a really dangerous mentality to have because these storms act differently. I wish they were all the same. It would make our job so much easier if they just did the same thing over and over again, right? We would all know what to do. But in reality, even a small shift in the storm, that rapid intensification that Brian talked about, we have to be prepared for all of those scenarios. So we are evacuating with the potential that these things can happen, and the National Hurricane Center and the National Weather Service are really good at giving us solid information so that we don't over-evacuate, but there are gonna be times where we evacuate and nothing will happen, and I hope that happens every time. When I talk to people down at Fort Myers Beach and others in Lee County that didn't evacuate, that decided to stay on a barrier island, and we asked them, why would you, why would you do that? And their response was, well, I've lived here for 15 years, I've lived here for 30 years, and we've never seen that kind of storm surge. We just didn't really think it could happen. We didn't think it was a reality. Yeah, we heard the evacuation order, we heard what you were saying, but we just didn't think it was gonna happen to our house, right? And that, again, don't make your decisions based on what you've experienced in the past. We don't want to have to work with Chief Desi and his team to come and rescue you from your home because that's going to be a really tricky process. Um, it, it just want you to move out of storm's way, out of the harm's way, and the storm's way, both. both. Um, so here's just a few more pictures of the storm surge impacts down at Fort Myers Beach. And this is for miles, this, this destruction. If you had an opportunity to go down there um, after the storm, uh, there are still areas that are not rebuilt. The recovery process is going to take an incredibly long time for some people. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind. We're going to do everything we can to get services back up, power, utilities, water infrastructure. Um, but rebuilding is a totally different situation. And there were people who, again, um, swam out of their homes. You could easily Google if you're not familiar with some of the situations down there and some of the experiences. There are some people that live to tell the tale of surviving and clinging onto trees and or their whole house shifted off of its foundation and floated down the street. Um, there are some people that didn't survive that either. But if you're interested to hear firsthand from some people who said they will never stay again, I would encourage you to do that research because the community and the makeup of the beach is very similar to Longboat Key here. We had boats where cars should have been and cars where boats should have been. And uh, this again is a very important thing. If you own a boat, please do what you can to secure it. 
Um, law enforcement will cut boats in half if they are interrupting the street, as they had to do in this situation. Um, we spent a lot of time with the uh, state to try to work on a system to extract cars uh, from canals and the ocean. Um, so this is a huge undertaking. And then our biggest story was the loss of bridges. So we lost two, two main bridges, one out to Pine Island, and one, uh, this one is from Sanibel, uh, the, Sanibel cause, the Sanibel Bridge and the Pine Island Causeway. So again, uh, the state did a tremendous job. Florida Department of Transportation came in. Once they got to work, it took them three days to do temporary repairs to Pine Island, and it took them about two weeks to do temporary repairs to, to Sanibel Island. In the meantime, we were running emergency helicopter um, air ops to go out and evacuate people who they decided not to evacuate. So again, I don't want that to be you, to be in a situation where we might have to come and helicopter you off if we lose bridges out to Longboat Key. And again, you know, Chief Desi and his team evacuate off of the island. They're not going to be here, and I'm sure you guys may touch on that a little bit. Um, so, but if you still need 911 call, and we will put a uh, stacked uh, by order of severity of cases. Um, but if you're concerned about having medical attention and the ability to get to a hospital and uh, get help like that, that may be just be in and of itself a reason to evacuate. So let's talk about evacuations because as uh, we already talked about this morning, half of Longboat Key is in Sarasota County and the other half is in Manatee County. There is a, a memorandum of understanding between the counties that we will be the one, Sarasota County will be the entity to evacuate the whole key so that there isn't confusion and it's really a clear message. Sarasota County, when we issue the evacuation, we don't use terms like voluntary and mandatory. Uh, we've ceased doing that because it created confusion for people. So now we just say evacuate. If you hear the words evacuate, that means that you need to leave. And don't wait to start putting up your shutters and preparing your plan for when we say the word evacuate. You should be doing that as the storm is approaching so you're ready to go when that evacuation order is called. Usually at seminars, I'll ask people to look at the map. You guys in your bags have our new preparedness guide. This map is in there if you want to take a look at it. You can also go to our website, scgov.net, and you can look up addresses. It's real easy for you, though. Guess what? You're all in red. You're all A zone, okay? Real easy, real easy. Um, so lastly, I just want to touch on some things that you can do right now. is a wonderful time to create a plan. If you do not already have a plan for what you're going to do and where you're going to go to evacuate, I want you to go home and have conversations today with your family members and loved ones and come up with a plan. A, this is not good for you guys. This is probably good for most other people, but it is possible that we have a tropical storm or a, a storm that doesn't have a lot of storm surge. It might be okay for you to stay at home. Uh, most storms you'll probably you know, be evacuated, but if it's a lower level, less winds, storm surge threat is low, we may not evacuate you, um, but only stay home if it's safe. Stay with a family and friend outside of the evacuation area. We are going to try to convince you not to come to the evacuation centers only if you absolutely need to go there. Okay? They are uncomfortable. There's going to be a lot of brand new friends you can meet, okay? a lot of people, um, but we don't recommend it. We don't have cots at general population shelters. We have food and water. It's just a place to get people inside that's safer than staying at their homes. So we really encourage you, find a hotel, find a family or friend to stay with. In, uh, and I'll let Matt cover uh, in, Manatee cover, in Manatee County, you, regardless if you live on the Sarasota or the Manatee side, you can go to either county's shelters. No one's going to stop you from going to either side. Um, but we have 12 that we open for general population. No pre-registration is required. If you have significant medical needs you, or you are on oxygen or dependent on electricity from medical equipment, you can apply for a medically dependent shelter. Those shelters have generator power, which is why we reserve those spaces for people with those kinds of conditions. You can go to our website, scgov.net forward slash be prepared, or call 311 to get registered. And we operate that with the Department of Health. They help us with that, with that shelter. Pets are free to, uh, available. They can come out available, but they, you can bring your pets, bring your pets. 
Um, they can come to spring cages, leash, all the equipment that you would need to take care of your pet. Um, and then uh, lastly, if you have any barriers to transportation and you need a ride to a shelter, please let us know. You can call 311, they'll help you get registered for a ride. If you need any other information in addition to the guides that you have, please reach out. We're happy to help you with that. Um, we do have Twitter and Facebook, actually I think it's called X now, so, or Facebook, um, so follow along on social media. And uh, Brian mentioned Alert Sarasota County, and that's alertsarasotacounty.com. If you sign up for that, we'll be sending alert messages through that to let you know about evacuations. We also utilize FEMA's system that allows us to hit cell phone towers. So if you're not signed up for this, you'll still get alerts to your phone, like you typically get for Amber Alerts, it's that same kind of an alert. So we're gonna be issuing alerts that way as well. So that is all the time I have. Thank you guys so very much. Make sure, all right, can you, can you guys hear me okay? All right, perfect. Just a touch really quick on um, what Sandra's point was. Uh, so for Manatee County, we do ours a little bit different. Our shelters, we do not open them all at the same time. We have a phased approach. Um, our first three that we open are our pet friendly shelters, Mills, Miller, and Freedom Elementary. Um, you can find them by going to mymanatee.org slash weather. All of our information for all the storms, our sandbag locations, shelter openings, what we're doing is on that. Um, you are more than welcome to come to our shelters if they're opening at the same time. Um, we don't check your residency. We would not say, nope, you're on the wrong side of the, 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 you know, the island, none of that. So we just want you to be safe. So we're gonna talk really quick a little bit about some business and disaster preparedness. A lot of this will mimic some of the things that um, you will do or, or see in your personal lives for your personal preparedness. So we really want you to prepare and plan for your business. Um, a lot of things that can happen, uh, especially storm surge, big, big things that we see, storms, um, we see coming. But there are a lot of smaller things that, like tornadoes or um, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic that we just didn't see coming. Uh, all those little things can be mitigated a little bit by some of the preparedness actions. So some of the natural disasters that you and your staff might be facing are obviously our natural ones, are floods, or hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, earthquakes, not so much here. And serious widespread illnesses, other human caused accidents. Um, obviously we've seen uh, cars going off of roads before and causing damage to businesses, but also some acts of violence. Uh, and then some te technological um, aspects. So most people now have a smartphone Everyone basically carries a computer in their, their body at all times. So uh, technological attacks, cyber attacks are becoming more and more relevant and um, more, they're happening more frequently. So we want you to think about those kind of aspects in your business. So here's some statistics, I'm never good at saying that, stats, uh, for natural disaster impact. So immediately after um, a disaster, particularly when it comes to a large disaster like a hurricane, 40% of small businesses will not reopen. 40% of them. And one year later, 25% additional small businesses will end up closing. And then three years later, 47 of the businesses without a continuity plan will fail. And that is without. We do not want you to be one of those people that are without that continuity plan. So it takes a long time to recover from a disaster, but these little steps that you can take along the way can help you speed that process up. So number one is um, be a ready business program. So we have a ready business program through FEMA, ready.gov uh, business. It'll help you get some information uh, for the business leaders in the community on how they can start preparing, um, they're making their plans, checklists, guiding information on what you should be doing. And the, the program is free. It does not cost you anything. Um, you, it's all available online. Go there, go there often and tell all your other uh, coworkers, your, your other business associates, people that you work with in the community about that as well. So step one we're gonna want you to do is assess your risk. 
So everyone has different risks depending on the type of business they have, just like the type of home you have has different risks and uh, involvement. And it all is dependent on the actual disaster itself. So while we are talking about hurricanes, there are, again, smaller instances that, depending on what, you're, what you do, if you are a mom and pop store that's only open nine to five, and it's something that's happening uh, overnight, may not be impacted as much uh, in the aspect of, like say a parade or something like that. It's not gonna affect your business as much because um, you're not operating. But if you have a business that is open much longer, or you, you know, again, you have that sort of parade or something that's coming through a specialized event, you need to take those into consideration. So every business has unique vulnerabilities and weaknesses, uh, and you should be looking at those factors. So knowing which disasters are more likely to happen um, can help you also prepare in those a extra actions. So here, one of the things that we even talk about, obviously outside of hurricanes, is coastal inundation. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, this past winter, we had three times that we had uh, substantial flooding in the coastal flooding in the area, especially on the north part of the island. Um, and right now we have nine king tides this year. Nine. We are in king tide right now, and that is king tide number two. So we want you to also think about those, those things. Um, it is great to keep up with the National Weather Service that is giving us the information, as well as some of the aspects of uh, being able to look at um, the, the buoy counts. What, what are the tidal gauges happening? There's predictive indexes that can really help you understand the threat and risk. So insurance. Insurance is very important. It is very expensive. We understand that. However, the county and what we do as a government is to make you back to your new normal. We are not going to build you back to what you had before. We are here to assist you and make sure you're safe. We do not have a checkbook that we can also just sign and give you guys checks, I'm sorry. So we want you to make sure ahead of season or way ahead of a storm, your policy is up to date. It has got everything that you need covered. Uh, most new policies have a threshold between 30 to 90 days that you cannot uh, pull off of them until after that. So make sure you have flood insurance. Homeowners insurance, business, most business insurance does not cover flood, so that is separate. Um, preparing your home, your vehicles, and businesses according to your insurance policies and how they are required you guys to either border up your windows or lock your doors, turning off your electricity, however that, so make sure you read into your policy. And then knowing where your insurance documents are at all times. Either keeping them on flash drives, bringing them with you wherever, have multiple copies in either safety deposit boxes, friend's house, wherever you need it to be, even in the cloud because after the event, eventually some, some of the processes will come back online that you'll be able to gather those documents. But you wanna make sure you have multiple copies of that so you can access them at any time. So step two we're gonna look at is creating your plan. So one of the most important things is level one. Your level one is with your staff, planning and preparedness protection for the staff. So either their personal pre um, preparedness plans, what they're going to be doing, and most importantly, how they're going to help either your guests or visitors um, what happens during an, an activation of some sort, whether it's an emergency right there in, a, uh, in, in the back. We've all probably done fire drills in school, maybe tornado drills in school. We now know that, um, we, we know what to do when there's a, a, an, an emergency like a fire drill. That's because it's drilled into our head. We do it over and over and over. You speed lots of deaths from fires. Not as much anymore because we practice that. So practice your plan with your staff constantly, at least one time of year. Um, go over your plan, what they're going to do, what they're going to help with the visitors, whether that be the patrons or the people staying at maybe your hotel. What are they going to do? Because those people are going to follow your staff's lead. Again, then you're going to want to look at your surrounding. What elements do you have? Do you have stuff that's out and about your business that may cause um, problems? Maybe you have stuff outside that looks pretty. Maybe you need to bring that inside because if the winds pick that up, it can damage your home. Maybe you have uh, gutters or other uh, surfaces on your, your building itself that need to be updated or looked at. Then you're going to look at your space. What about your workspace inside, your inventory, your filing systems? Uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to put things up on, you know, cap on top of cabinets? Are you going to take that paperwork with you? Is it electronic? Can you access it outside of your actual business or the computer that you have in your business? your systems including your operations of the building and general located, um, so your t utility systems, your water, your electric, your gas if you have it, where are those shutoffs? Who knows how to shut off those things? Who knows how to turn them back on? Who knows those processes? And then uh, your structure, so your architectural structure itself, 
Not all buildings are created equal. Um, so we have building codes for a reason, but just because your business was built the same year as another business, they might have put in more money to do um, hurricane proof windows. Maybe they have a better structure on the actual outside. Roofing, all of those things you need to be looked at by either an engineer, roofing company, a licensed professional that can help you with that. And then finally, the service is opportunities to engage the organization um, that can serve the community. So what we have some of our, our community organizations here are helping to better serve the community by helping you guys get information in ahead of time. We want you to build a kit for at home and for in person, uh, at home and for your business. So each of you will have different things depending on what your business is or what your personal life is. Uh, for me, I know it sounds really weird, one of the things I have to do when I have in my evacuation kit when I go to the EOC is gummy worms. It's just, it's, it's my thing, I, that's what I do, it's my stress relief. <laughs> so it looks a little bit different for everyone, but generally you're gonna wanna make sure you have your plan, ways to cut off, uh, shut off electricity, food and water for individuals as well. And we ask that you have that for at least seven days, at least a week. And that's not because we're not gonna be able to get to you, it's because there might not be services that we can bring to you um, in that event. But it's okay, because you're not gonna be staying here, you're gonna be evacuating, but afterwards you might need to have some of this stuff. And then number three, uh, your step three is executing your plan. Practice with your staff over and over and over. Because what's gonna happen, and we see it with police, fire, they go back to their training. When something gets scary, they go back to their training. So train, train, train your staff. They should know the ins and outs of the plan, what's gonna be happening, when it's gonna be happening. They don't need to know every single minute detail, but they need to know what they need to do to help better your business and your visitors. And Finally, we have some information with the uh, Longbow Chamber of Commerce that has a business self-assessment. It is also online with that ready.gov slash business. Um, so please do go ahead and, and complete that survey. It just gives you a jumping start. If you already have a plan, it can tell you what to do to better your plan. Um, and if you don't have a plan, it can tell you where you need to start. So other than that, um, that is all I have. I, my last slide says questions, but we're taking questions later. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everybody. How are you doing this afternoon? Good. I'm doing good because I'm not at work right now saying partly cloudy skies, no chance for rain. <laughs> right? But uh, we will have a chance here in a little bit. I've got a slideshow just to give a little history if you don't know who I am. I know there's a lot of new people here. How many people are experiencing their first hurricane season? So we've got a few here. So that's, that's interesting. That's good that you guys are here. About, uh, it, it, just coming to this conference alone will help you uh, considerably by listening to the experts uh, and getting valuable tips. And I can tell you, I could be up here for two hours talking about tips, so I can't do that. But you can go to their websites, our website, at mysuncoast.com, click on the Hurricane tab, and you'll get all the information you want to know. And you can watch our special. That's a little self-promotion. But still, it's a good idea to get out and get information from any source. And Manatee County and Sarasota County have excellent websites. And you can even find your level of evacuation. Now, you guys don't have to worry about it, but your friends do and family do, do maybe, inland areas. I had some guy that called me up just yesterday, you know, what zone am I in? I, or, I said, if you're in a level of evacuation, you're in a flood zone. Remember that, too. There's differences uh, in inland areas. Uh, and right away, I went to Sarasota County, know your level. I did a Google search, pops up, and then, boom, you hit it, put your address in. It tells you right away what level of evacuation you're in. So tell your friends and family that live off the island about that. That's not just Sarasota either, it's Manatee County on top of that. So this is 38 years now. Whoa, I'm getting old. And I think I've done this every year, uh, maybe once I missed it, I'm not sure. But this is the best turnout we've seen uh, here for, for this. Uh, I think it's because of the storms, right? Good job. Round of applause for yourselves and for the directors here that put all this together. Uh, I've flown into two hurricanes, Hurricane Bertha in 1996 and then uh, Hurricane Ivan in 2004. You're going, boy, that guy's crazy. Yeah, well, I am a little bit. You've got to be if you're doing the weather, right? I mean, we don't, we don't know most of the time where these storms are going to go before the season starts. But when they get going, the National Hurricane Center, along with the National Weather Service, they have a forecast that they look at and they look at all different forecast modeling 
And we'll go over that in just a little bit. The different models that you see on CNN or Fox or whatever news you watch are all based from the National Hurricane Center. No one is out there with their own model saying this is where the storm is going. In fact, all meteorologists on television that have the AMS seal have to go with what the National Hurricane Center says. And what I mean by that is the cone of uncertainty. I remember I talked to a, a National Hurricane director once, and he said, we'd like to call it the cone of inclusion. Uncertainty gives us a bad name. Well, we are uncertain uh, where exactly that storm is going, but it's getting better, and we'll show you that here in a little bit. But uh, our, our coast here has been blessed, right? Uh, we live in the Indian Protection Zone. Have you heard that? <laughs> th th this is... <laughs> and I, believe me, if that's, if that's the case, I, I'll go with it. You know, it doesn't matter for me. <laughs> Not that it's... Uh, it, it's sort of scientifically proven that our latitude is at a place that it's very difficult, but it does happen, where storms and their momentum when they're going northward typically continue around the Bermuda High and go up toward the Panhandle or the Gulf Coast states. There are times, however, in the year that you can see little systems come by, like we did with Charlie in 2004, over the southeast United States that gave it that push to the right. Now, a lot of people th come up to me and say, it's because of the warm waters in, in, in Charlotte Harbor. That's why it went that way. It likes the warm water. Well, it's not. Uh, it's basically based on the mid-level and high-level winds that direct the storm. So I, I know it seems that way, but... Uh, it, it's not. And there's no machine that can control them either. And some people have said that to me. There's a weather machine out there. First thing they say is harp. Harp's directing these storms. They go, okay, I'd like to have that machine. <laughs> Make a lot of money. Okay, so ABC7 is here to prepare you, not scare you. I've been doing this, as I said, 38 years, and that's our motto, and that's our goal. You won't see our reporters out there, you know, like a Jim Cantore waiting for the storm to come. But we're waiting for it here. <laughs> we're getting nervous. You know, I'm, I love seeing that because his hair doesn't blow. He's in that no hair, so you can't really tell. But you see it in the background with the people still swimming in the, the Gulf of Mexico there. There's nothing going on. You know, I kind of say that it's a little bit of a problem when it comes to television when there is a storm that's threatening us or potentially has the possibility of hitting here. You want to stay local. You want to stay local. You don't want to go to CNN and, 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 and Fox MSNBC, ABC Network, those guys are looking to sell soup in North Dakota. You understand that? So the more eyes they have, the ratings go up uh, considerably. But locally, we're able to keep in contact with the National Weather Service, the emergency managers, and city leaders as well, the American Red Cross, and then bring that information to you. And that's important, to get local information you know, they hype it up a little bit. You know, I, I feel kind of bad for the people in Fort Myers because I remember that uh, Hurricane Ian, and I was watching it, you know, I was watching the storm, and then all of a sudden I see the national media show up at Clearwater Beach, and they were loaded. I mean, they're all there. They're all waiting there. And you, 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 okay, it's Sunday. I'm down in Fort Myers. I'm having a couple of cocktails. I'm going, all right, Jim Cantore's up there. It's not coming here. We're okay. You know, the meme that comes out says, Wherever Jim is, look out. Well, it didn't happen there. And now I saw last year the, uh, the Weather Service, the National, uh, not the Weather Service, the, uh, 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 the Weather Channel, they now have stationed meteorologists that report from many different locations, not just one, which is good because, you know, you want to you make sure that people realize that it could come to other locations too. So this was last season, okay? And last season there were a lot of storms, I mean, more than average, but notice the pattern, all out, for the most part, in the Atlantic. And the reason why that was is we had a lot of west, uh, westerly shear going on, a lot of westerly winds due to El Nino, and so it forced a lot of the storms out there. Now, typically during El Nino, you're not supposed to have a lot of storms, but we did last year because of the warm waters. Uh, thankfully, not much hit us here along the, the west coast of Florida. Uh, here is uh, Adalia. That was the biggest storm. The surge on the right. I remember going to Anna Maria Island. There was a king tide at the time, and they did have significant flooding. Uh, that, that surge really got up to five feet, and that was with a storm well offshore of our area. So Longboat Key, even though the storm may not make a direct hit, uh, if we're on the right side of that center, it's going to be a problem here with storm surge. It doesn't matter, king tide or no tide. I mean, you're still going to get a surge with a big storm like we saw with this one, and even bigger with a bigger storm, obviously. 
Uh, this is a, a look at the uh, ENSO probabilities. We heard this earlier from Brian. Uh, you can see the blue indicates when we're going to see La Nina. And it's going to happen. It's in transition right now. So we're out of El Nino. We're in a neutral. We're going to La Nina. And La Nina means less year in the atmosphere, more storms developing in the main development region and getting into the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. So that's the problem. And this is the multi-decadal oscillation. I like to be able to say those things. It makes me feel, you know, like a meteorologist. <laughs> this is uh, basically the blue indicates cold periods in the Atlantic and the red is the warm water. And you can see since about 1995, it has been above average. And this is a cycle that happens every two, three decades. So we're still in that cycle, and that's the reason why the prediction for a lot of storms this year. This is the guy that does it right there. He looks like he just got out of high school. Eh? <laughs> Dr. Philip Klotzwell, I had a chance to meet with him, talked to him several times, had dinner with him. Uh, his cohort who started it, Dr. William Gray, is the one from Colorado State who started that program. And I trust these guys. I trust them all. Noah comes out with theirs now. I think there's about 15 different groups that predicts the number of storms each year. But it doesn't matter. You know, we've got a lot of people here, and people are speculating, oh, it's because we saw Ian, we saw these storms threaten, we saw Dahlia. That's why everyone's here. Well, in reality, if the forecast came out a month ago or so and said there's only going to be five storms this year, would it be as packed? It should be. It doesn't matter. So keep that in mind. It doesn't matter how many storms are predicted. Each year, if we get a storm hit here, it could be devastating. Just one. And let me see if I can get the, There he is. That's him right there. <laughs> what? He, he lives in Colorado. So he doesn't care. He's, you know, he's in Colorado. No storm surge. And, and so um, he's a really good guy. <laughs> uh, here's the blue line. The blue line to the right is when we're in La Nina. Florida's chance of getting hit uh, by a hurricane go up as a result of La Nina. And so just keep that in mind. We, we are going to get hit in Florida, I would say, with pretty much certainty that somewhere in Florida we'll get hit or impacted by a hurricane this year. And there's the names. You heard about them right there. Bob has been retired, unfortunately. You would think, you know, early name wouldn't get retired, but it hit Kenny Bunkport, I can't remember how many years ago, but I think it was the first male name, too. The first male name used. They started in 79 using male names, and they alternate each year. And Bob was the first name, and then it got retired because it caused a lot of damage. On top of that, um, my birthday is at the end of hurricane season, November 30th. So remember that, and when we don't get hit, hey, I'll send Bob a card, okay, <laughs> or, or a present, doesn't matter. But the names are kind of funny. I asked a hurricane director once, what's the number one question you get at a, at a hurricane seminar? He goes, when is my name going to be on the list? <laughs> when is my name going to be on the Okay. Uh, historic four hurricanes in 2004. I also asked the director, and I talked to a research scientist down in Fort Mi I mean, in Miami. Uh, his name is Hugh Willoughby. He, he actually does studies for climate. And I, I said, man, that, that 2004 was a crazy year. He goes, yeah, it, it will, and he said this, it will never happen again. I go, okay. That comes from the science. The odds of it happening are very, very unlikely of Florida getting hit by four, but it could happen. So I say with the weather, you know, I say no chance for rain, and all of a sudden a big storm hits, and they go, what, Bob, you said there was no rain. And sure enough, we get hit. So that was a crazy year, and the Ivan storm I flew into, that's the one that hit up in the panhandle of Florida. There's 2005. That was terrible. These are composites now. It's not all at once. These are all the storms that hit. And then there was the postcard that I sent out. Welcome to Florida. Some, some people put the state up in North Dakota at that point. And this was the headlines that read 2006 from the, uh, from the National Geographic. Look at that article. 2000, killer hurricanes. There's no end in sight. Guess what happened? No major hurricanes hit the U.S. 10 years after that article came out. So that just tells you. It's a Sports Illustrated jinx, right? You get on the cover, he's the rookie of the year, next thing you know, you bomb. Well, they bombed in that because we didn't have any storms. And then the Weather Channel, uh, this is uh, not a kick on them, they're good, but they're always looking for a storm. I remember Jim Cantore they sent everywhere, down in the Caribbean, down in Cancun. They were looking for storms to cover because they know their ratings go sky high when there's a storm around. So uh, the Weather Channel is always looking for that. Uh, Florida leads the way. If you don't know it, you move to Florida, you said, oh, this is a great state, love it, great beaches, sunshine, it's usually pretty nice. Well, if we get hit by more hurricanes than any other state 
in the U.S. That's based in statistics. Oh, what's this? Oh, my gosh, this is a, a recent shot of what could be happening, not this Friday, but next. You see that in the Gulf of Mexico? A lot of people are posting this on social media. And I must warn you that you'll see these things and you'll go, wow, there's a hurricane coming. Don't believe the GFS long-range forecast. I can tell you that. You can kind of say, yeah, it's hinting at something, but the GFS, if you don't know it, is a U.S. forecast model. And it is known to, to spin up these storms that don't ever materialize. And it's been pretty consistent over the last couple of days. I just wanted to show you that. That's a recent picture I snapshotted off of uh, Tropical Tidbits, and that's a popular website that people go to to check things out. So uh, that's the GFS forecast model. That's, you know, a long way away. And then that's the European, same day. Which one do you like? <laughs> yeah, I like the European. I'm much better there. Uh, storms that do develop in June, remember, remember aren't, aren't going to be your Category 5s. They're not going to be 4s, and they could be 3s this year because the water temperature is so warm. But uh, June, July storms are usually pretty, um, in, I don't want to say weak, but they're, they're, they're less intense than a major hurricane, okay? And no storm is weak, even a tropical storm. We'll show you that in a little bit. And be careful on the Internet. Remember I told you people are going to those websites and kind of getting their information based on that? You can do that, look at it, but then get confirmation from your local television station. Uh, they'll be up to date with what's going on. You see that? That's a shark on Bayshore Gardens in Tampa during a hurricane. That passed around social media. It got millions of views, but there was no shark going down the road in Bayshore Gardens. I believe that's a shark. Well, if it isn't, they, they had to. Uh, fuel for the storms. This is what's happening right now. Well above average. So, yes. The water temperature is extremely warm right now, and that is not a good sign in the Caribbean because the Caribbean and the Western Caribbean Sea, those are the ones that typically have an impact on us here in Florida. And I'm always concerned about storms that develop in, in the Western Caribbean. There's the, uh, the hook, right? You see that? It goes around the periphery of the high-pressure ridge. You can see that bend. So it goes west, gets into the Gulf. That's the Indian blessing right there. Heads north and then turns to the northeast after it bypasses us. That's what we're hoping for. Uh, but it, it doesn't happen all the time. You know, the Indians, I don't know where, where they were in 1944, but we had a... How, who was here in 1944? Sometimes I get a hand up. I, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, in 44, we got hit by a hurricane. It made landfall right into Sarasota, and there weren't a lot of people there, but the Gulf of Mexico made it all the way to where the Ford dealership is there in US 41. You know where that is, right? That's where... That's where the uh, surge made it, so the surge is bad. This was the fuel prior to Ian, so we keep an eye on all these things. We watch them, and we bring you up to date with them. Uh, so a storm developing in the Western Caribbean is dangerous. We saw that with Ian. It went through rapid intensification. Real quick, you see there a tropical storm to a hurricane to a major hurricane in five days. That was the forecast. But look at that forecast. That was accurate five days out. It was right on. And that was the National Hurricane Center. So they do a great job. They took, take a look at all the models and make the forecast, and they put it out. Uh, that cone that you see right there, and we heard about the cone, it comes out, and it will be a different one each time that the forecast comes out, and it's every six hours, okay, every six hours. So we'll wait for it. It'll come out at 5, and then it'll come out just before 11 o'clock, and we're scrambling to get it on. Sometimes they're delayed a little bit in getting it out by 11 o'clock at night. So that's the reason why sometimes you may see some older graphics at 11, because they're deciding on evacuations at that point when it gets closer to us. Uh, Ian, a Category 5 prior to landfall, we heard that too. Uh, eyewall replacement is a big deal. It's a huge deal. It's when the storm goes through um, a, a metamorphosis. So, so it goes from a smaller storm. It's like the ice skater, right, that, you know, spins around, spins around, as the storm is getting stronger and stronger and it gets narrow, that ice skater is like this, right, spinning around that fast. Well, what happens when he or she throws her arms out, the storm becomes wider and they slow down. The storm does slow down, but it can pick up strength, and that's certainly what Ian did in this case. It's called the angular theory of momentum, another good term I can throw in there. So I'm a meteorologist, okay, or <laughs> something like that. So that was it. That was the radar picture. And I know you guys have a lot of questions, so I don't want to go too long up here because uh, questions are always good at these things they, uh, you know, get to the point of what you guys are concerned about. So we're, we're going to get to those in a little bit. Uh, and there's a meteorologist, John. I don't want to spend any more days with John. I like him. But <laughs> I spent the night, I think, you know, two nights there during Ian. I think all told, over my 38 years, I've spent about six nights 
at the station. There's always good food, though, so I'm, I'm happy about that. I bring a little flask in. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got to get to sleep, you know. I got to get to sleep. Uh, storm surge is a really big problem here if it were to happen. We've never really had a significant surge here, if you think about it, until back in 1944. Knock on wood. Uh, the thing is, is that our coastline would enhance storm surge, and, and Brian knows that, and, and so does the meteorology department down at the National Hurricane Center. They actually have a department that projects storm surge. At one point, Longbow Key, when it was forecast to go up here, got up in the, in the storm surge was plus nine feet. I mean, I go, oh, geez. And then the next model came out, and it showed a shift, and it went down. I said, oh, this is a good sign. This is a good sign. But it's not definite yet. We're not sold on it yet. You don't want to bite on it quite yet. And, and I'll talk about that. We saw this earlier about the storm surge in Fort Myers. Look at the coastline there. This is something interesting to note. Is You see how Sanibel sticks out, and you see Fort Myers Beach to the right of that? Well, water piling into that has nowhere to go. So they were a little bit more vulnerable down there to have higher storm surge in this scenario. Now, a couple of years prior, they had Irma, and Irma was projected to bring a strong storm surge to Fort Myers. It was, but it made a little shift to the right, and so they ended up being on the left side of that storm. So the storm surge was not as, as intense. A lot of people evacuated, and that's what they should have done. But as we heard earlier from Sandra, you don't base your decisions on previous storms, and that was a big deal, I think, in Fort Myers. We saw it with Katrina uh, in Mississippi when those folks were asked to evacuate. They said, well, I was here during Camille, and I don't have to worry about it. I made it through Camille, the strongest storm ever. There's no problem for me. Well, it wasn't the strongest storm surge with Camille. It was with Katrina. So these storms behave differently, and you can see the destructive force, uh, the most deaths, since 1935 in the U.S. There's some of the projections that we heard 15 feet. There was the Labor Day hurricane in 1935. That was a Category 5 hurricane. There were a lot of people working in the Keys, and that's where they lost their lives. I think over 600 uh, at that point. And you can see what storm surge does. Some homes remain standing. Some of the newer homes will. And you can see some of those roofs there, too. Roofs important uh, when it comes to hurricane wind damage. And, of course, building strong and, and driving pilings in the ground also help. I was, this is my photo. I was kind of stupid. After Ian, I went out to Hidden River where they had nearly 18 inches of rainfall uh, from Ian. And you can see in the background, background there, those are cows, cattle, that they had to evacuate because there was nowhere to go. And I was walking around in this. You shouldn't do that, by the way. Just crazy weather folks that are getting pictures for news. The Jim Cantori's out there, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we heard this earlier, uh, water is the biggest problem. Most people are going to have problems with storm surge and floodwaters. So even though you evacuate and you go somewhere, remember where you're going. And look around you and see, okay, th there's a big lake here, there's a big pond here, that could go up high. Uh, there's all, and you guys have to make your own plan, okay? So wherever you go, and I can't tell you where to go, but I can tell you to get away from the evacuation zones, levels, uh, I remember one of our anchors during, uh, I believe it was Charlie, said on the air, and she was in the morning, and she goes, hey, you guys, you guys got to evacuate. I don't, you know, go to Arcadia. Just get out of here. Well, if you don't know it, Charlie went right into Arcadia. <laughs> and I was at one of these seminars the week before at the Sarasota Yacht Club, and I said, hey, if you live on the Barrier Islands, you need to evacuate. You know, take everything with you and go, and, and, and go evacuate. I did not say go to a place where there's no hurricane protection and ride the storm out. They did, and he did, Roger Stevens. He comes up to me and says uh, a few weeks later, Bob, I did everything you said. I got my stuff, I got my cars, I got my family. We evacuated and we went to Arcadia. I said, I didn't say that. Did you hear that from our anchor? No, no, no. Anyway, that home that they stayed in was a three-story at um, uh, Magnolia Street was wiped out, basically. I mean, they survived. 17 people hid underneath a stairwell uh, as the windows exploded outward, and all their cars were basically destroyed there. That was in Arcadia. You think, oh, we're out of the way. And Orlando had stronger winds there with Charlie than we did here in Lombo Key. And I'm going to zip through these because I know I'm going long. I, I, you know, I do the weather. They give me three minutes. When I'm up here, I can go an hour, man. There's, there's no producer. <laughs> Jeez Louise, this is good. Um, the big concern also is not storm surge, as I said, is flooding. 
Flooding is 60 inches with Hurricane Harvey. 60. That's more than our entire year's worth of rain. Not lately, but I mean, you know, 60 inches of rain in four days. And at one point it was just a tropical storm. So this is a, these are big deals. And, and storm surge, you see with this, this was Category 5. Michael, it went from a tropical storm to a major Category 5 hurricane in less than three days. Less than three days. So you're thinking, oh, the projection is uh, for this storm to only be a Category 1 hurricane or 2 hurricane if you're in the panhandle. Remember, intensity forecasting isn't as good as where the storm's heading. The National Hurricane Center will admit that. In fact, I talked to a director again. I've, I've talked to them all. I don't know if you guys know Neil Frank from years ago, but that was always an inter interesting interview. Uh, they said you get a dartboard, put a one in the middle, and then five, in the, and throw a dart, and it could be just as accurate in some cases in determining intensity five days out. So there it is, 160 mile an hour winds. There's the forecast. It was expected to be a hurricane when it makes land, made landfall. And there's the plane I flew in. I, I flew in the, uh, the P-3 Orion on the top left and the C-130. I'm looking to get on the Gulf Stream 4 here soon, but we'll see what happens. And then I'll, I'll, I'll maneuver the drone around. The drone's becoming a really big deal now, too. And, and then the, this is the accuracy of where the storm's going. See how it's going down? So we're getting a lot better over the years. When I say we, it's the National Hurricane Center and the modeling. There's the intensity forecasting. The trend isn't all that great. If you look at 1990, where it was about oh, eight miles off, you look at 2000, I believe that's 17, it looks to be about eight, nine, eight and a mile, nine miles off, too, in the 24-hour forecast. So a couple more slides here. That was uh, Irma, and then we'll get to some of your questions. How am I doing on time, Chief? Where's the Chief? Am I doing all right? Five minutes, five minutes. Then I got to do my headstand. You guys know about my headstand? I only do that before the storms arrive. The Western Caribbean Sea, the blue that you see right there, the blue dots, those are all the storms that developed during La Nina. Major storms. You see the one on the uh, top there? That's El Nino. So we're in La Nina during the heart of the season. So be prepared. And there's the last hundred years. You can still see a little bit of our area, though. You know, everyone else is kind of blocked out. So we don't, we don't get here as often. And that's just a close-up look. And I'll blast through these because I want to get to one slide here at the end. Uh, so this is an interesting graphic. Things change in Florida. You know, we go sometimes to a lot of activity to no activity. We saw that in that 10-year stretch, right? Well, you've got to remember that air conditioning was invented, what, around late 50s? And then look at the population in the boxes there. Keeps going up. We weren't hit by any hurricanes. Now, come to Florida. There's no problem here. We don't, hurricanes, we don't have those. And now everyone's in place, so look out uh, for the season. Uh, this is cyclone activity across the globe, and you can see that it's actually trending downward, although it's upward here in the Atlantic. This, this is from, uh, I can't remember the exact location. And then I'll end up with this. Debbie, Brian brought this up. Look at the forecast from the National Hurricane Center. I remember this storm. This was a tropical storm, and the National Hurricane Center said, okay, this thing's going to move toward Texas. All right, that was the forecast that came out. There was what they were looking at. Those are all the different models that they look at. Wow, some are going to Louisiana, some are going to Texas. Uh, we're going we're gonna to say that the European model was more correct. We're going to go with that. So they went with that forecast. And then look what happened. Okay, so there it is changing a little bit now. And then eventually it went into Florida. Last thing, we want to control these storms, right? If we could have a way to stop them, it would be great. African dust does that. But the problem is, is that you can't control the African dust. I say put a bunch of fans, you know, Bill Gates is uh, working on this, and put them in Africa and just blow the sand all the time. It transports all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. That sand is so fine. On top of that, some people have suggested putting some icebergs in front of these storms to cool the water down. All right, well, that's pretty tough to bring a big iceberg down for a massive storm like that. While others have come up with ideas, how about a nuclear bomb? Well, the fallout might hurt. Okay, well, what about material that can absorb moisture, like in a garden? That if you're going on vacation, you throw this around your garden and you spray it, and it just releases the water very slowly, but it absorbs it. 
They did it. They thought that might work. But the problem is you'd have to put a lot of that material, biodegradable material, in the storm to bring it down just a little bit. So there's no real way to figure it out. But you think about all the money that we've lost uh, through uh, the uh, destructive force. You know, eventually they're going to figure it out. AI will say something. You know, they'll figure it out. Put up a bunch of big fans right along the east coast of the United States. And just, when it comes, just blow it out there at the mid-levels. It would be 30,000 feet up there, those fans, but I don't know how, how you get them up there. Bill Gates came up with the, the best idea so far. He patented the idea. And he said, we have a bunch of ships together with big tubes that go down to the colder water. And then you have pumps, and they're all intertwined. All right? And it brings the colder water up. I think that's been the best. And he patented that idea. And you have, you know, you got to have a lot of ships, obviously, but that's a lot of work and a lot of energy, but you never know, it may, it may help out. The best thing to do is just realize that if you don't have these hurricanes, you think it's hot right now, it would be extremely hot that you wouldn't be able to live here without them. They exchange the heat so well that uh, I, I kind of like the after effects. You come out, and you, you know, after a hurricane, it's like a cold front's come through. Wow, this is great. Here you are in August, and, and it feels really nice out there. All right, as promised, um, we're going to answer some of your questions. I think you guys got pieces of paper. We're not doing any questions yet. Oh, we're not doing Oh, I'm sorry. We, we, have, we, we have one more. Okay, we have one more. I, I'm the weather guy. I get it wrong sometimes, right? <laughs> Partly cloudy, scattered showers, <laughs> highs in the low 90s. All right. Man, that's an awful sound. All right, hi everybody. Thank you, Bob. Um, I am the Marketing and Communications Director for the Manatee County uh, uh, Tourism Office. Woof, I've been in Greenville, South Carolina today and now I'm here presenting in front of you guys. Uh, You know, I'm gonna have to put a call into the writers I know at Nat Geo and be like, hey, you know that piece you ran and we didn't have a hurricane for 10 years after? Why don't we put that back into circulation? (laughs) (laughs) So I'm gonna talk to you today about tourism and why tourists are important and why we shouldn't forget about them. And I'm gonna do it as briefly and succinctly as possible. But first I wanna say uh, I am an employee of Manatee County, which means during a storm, I am activated. That is different from my friends at Visit Sarasota where they are not directly a part of Sarasota County, so their operations are a little different during the storm, but we're all working together to have the same message. We are getting into what we call a shoulder season, for tourism, which means we're starting to see things kind of level off. I think we all know peak season is about February through March. So we love these shoulder seasons. It gives us a chance to uh, catch our breath and kind of, you know, say, good job, pat on the back. We did it. We survived another year. Uh, And enjoy our beautiful assets, which is why we're all residents and enjoy them on an annual basis. But it's really important to note that even September is probably our slowest tourism season, we really start to amp back up and welcome them back in about October, November. So there's still months of hurricane season where we're seeing a lot of people come from Milwaukee, Grand Rapids, Denver, Colorado, people who have no idea what a hurricane is or what to do in it. You know, Sandra made a good point about being from the Midwest and they know what to do during a tornado, but they're two completely different things. So it's our job to make sure that we're following Matt's lead and Sandra's lead in the event of a storm and making sure that we are helping to deliver a calm yet effective message to make sure they understand what their role is in the event of a storm. So our role during a hurricane is to maintain ongoing communication with Matt and his team to make sure we are doing our part to understand what hotel inventory is available. So we touched on evacuation. Some people may need medical assistance during, and maybe that shelter's full. They need access to electricity. My team, we're activated. We actually use a third party um, agency to help us make phone calls to every single hotel in Manatee County to find out pre-storm, during storm, and post-storm how many room nights we have available. 
And that's really significant when we get post-storm because I think we all saw for Ian, I don't know if anybody was on 75, the caravans of people coming into our destinations, right, from all these other counties as far as out of state, those people need places to stay. FEMA needs places to stay. The Red Cross needs places to stay. So that's why our job is to make sure we have a really active count of how many rooms are available to those people. I'll tell you, my office is out of the convention center. We hosted the National Guard. We had about 200 National Guards, men and women, who actually were working on active recovery um, and rescues. And it was quite an honor to have them call our convention center home during that time. We're also the communication link to hotels throughout the county. So again, making sure that they understand how to speak to people who are staying in their hotels. We do not want any disaster tourists. Yes, that is a thing. Do not come and watch it. Please go and evacuate and be safe. Because that creates a bigger problem for my friend right here. <laughs> we don't want to rescue you, but we will if we have to. So making sure, and this is really important, does anybody have a rental property? Here? No? Okay. I will skip that one. Just to touch on communication to follow, if you are a business owner or you know somebody who maybe owns a restaurant or it could be as simple as selling coconuts on the beach, it's really important that you make sure you follow our communication channels. So whether that's on social media or it's through an email database to make sure that you're getting information from accurate sources. I think following Bob, it's really important to make this point. Not only should you use your local news sources, but you should really lean on your local government entities for accurate information. I think we all know, thank you, Bob, for the photo of the shark, huh. right? Going down Bayshore, not a shark, okay? You want accurate information, and sometimes social media can really be the devil in that instance of somebody saying something, and it sparks a conversation, and then all of a sudden things are just out of control, and Armageddon is coming to Anna Maria Island and Longboat Key. And what does that do? That creates panic, right? We don't want to panic. None of us up here want you to panic in the event of a storm. We want you to be informed, empowered, and feel like you have the resources available to you to make the correct decisions in the time of need. And we want to make sure that that is also reflected to our tourists as well. This is just an example of the email we send out to our partners. It's really important for me to also say we regurgitate everything that comes out of these offices. All we do is we speak to people a little differently, saying, hey, Pam from North Dakota. How are you doing today? There's a little storm coming our way. We wanted to make sure you knew about it. So maybe you look at these little resources and you kind of make an informed decision from there. We also make sure that we have an alert on our website, which is the BradentonGulfIslands.com. Again, it's gentle messaging. We don't want to uh, create panic for anybody. But we, again, want to make sure that we are an extra resource to our friends at the emergency operations centers. And then really, what is our role after a storm? I can tell you, working in tourism, my friends in Fort Myers are still recovering. And yes, you think tourism, sometimes we're the bad guy, right? Because we're bringing all the people in. But you know what those people bring? Money. They bring economic impact. They help our favorite local businesses stay open. That restaurant that you love and it has your favorite grouper sandwich, guess what? Your money is not the only thing sustaining that business. They need these tourism seasons. So if a major storm comes through and wipes us out, it is our job to tap into our reserves to come up with a marketing campaign and messaging to inform our visitors, say, hey, maybe not right now, but we're working on it. We know you love us and we love you, so hang in there. It's all about that morality. I'll tell you, after Ian, our beach camera page saw a 200% increase in web traffic. You want to know why that was? People care about the island. They care about the key. They want to know as it happens what's going on in the destination they love so much. They want to see us bounce back. They want to see us recover. 
and we want to help you do that. And that's our biggest role during the storm. So just to reiterate what Matt said from a business perspective, uh, it's so important to have that local community support. And that's it for me. Good afternoon. Before I get started, uh, Susan Phillips asked me to make a brief public service announcement. Um, alert Longboat Key. If you are currently receiving messages, do nothing. Your registration stays current. It's very important to be registered for e-notification, which is on the top right of the town's website. In addition to Alert Longboat Key, uh, there'll be some more important messages up there. So. After the seminar, after we're done up here and questions are done, Susan's sitting at the first de uh, table right there. Feel free to go back and talk to her about registering. Okay, so re-entry. I'm going to be very quick. Um, some of my colleagues have already spoken about uh, evacuation. Just so you know that the town of Longbow Key uh, and its employees, the employees will be evacuating the island at 45 miles an hour. Paul Desi, our fire chief, will give the word for the last of the town employees, which is usually the police and fire, and it has been our town manager, will evacuate until we can get back on the island for re-entry. So what we came up with was a tier system, and this came from uh, the former chief and I were attending a hurricane conference, the governor's hurricane conference in Fort Lauderdale, and we met with some of the other barrier islands to see what the best way was to get on and off the island for the residents in, I guess you can call it organized chaos. So <clears throat> what we came up with was this tiered program. So immediately following the storms, what's going to happen is we have a, what we call a TFIT, which is the first in team. And that's going to consist of the police department, a member of the fire department, our public works, who's going to have a backhoe to get us through. Hopefully, it's not going to be too bad, and we're hoping a member from FPNL. Our biggest obstacle is usually down trees and power lines. Once they make it onto the island and they do their assessment, is when we're going to go ahead and have Tier 1. So, Tier 1 is going to be our essential personnel. So, it's going to be law enforcement personnel. They're going to confirm residency or business affiliation. Once it's established, the agent will affix a decal once you get to the checkpoint. And this is why we're asking everybody to pay attention to your news stations, have a battery-operated radio, listen to your car radio, because the more people who want to get on when they're not supposed to get on is only going to cause more chaos. Our job is to try to keep everybody off for looting, uh, for safety reasons, and if our personnel are allocated, at the checkpoints before we can get help from you know, National Guard or some of the agencies, you know, it's going to leave the island unprotected. So these decal, once you show your proof of uh, residency, and that can either be with your driver's license, it can be with a utility bill, it can be with a, um, any, any documentation that the town issues that will have your address on it, and what we ask for the businesses, and we go through this every year with the businesses, let your key personnel that you need to assess whatever business. Longbow Key Club is going to have a lot more personnel than a very small mom and pop store. So that's up to you to decide how many people you want to let on because it's only going to cause confusion and chaos getting on the island. Uh, and as you can tell from last year, even the best laid plans, you know, get changed. We couldn't get on the island, including us, on the south end because we couldn't get across the bridge. So it had nothing to do with Longboat Key. So please pay attention to what they're saying on the radio. And of course, this tier system is fluid. We can go from the T-fit right to opening right up. The, the assessment says it's OK. We don't need to keep everyone off. The island opens up. So like I said, tier one uh, be the employees otherwise, and other authorized federal, state, and local agencies that need immediate access to the area to ensure restoration and critical services such as water, electrical, communications. 
The primary objective is personnel operating in this condition is to render the area safe for the first responders conducting life safe, safety operations. Tier two, this phase consists primarily of indiv individuals and businesses that support the reestablishment of critical infrastructure. And those include like Publix, uh, places uh, the, the, well, gas station, one gas station, our gas station. Um, <laughs> and we get, um, you know, we might need to get an ice truck out here uh, if we have no power for any length of time. So we need some of those areas uh, opening up for those, those personnel. Uh, the condominium hotel leaders, healthcare agencies, insurance agents, banking organizations, suppliers of food, and other business operators that are considered critical to the recovery effort. And tier three will be the residents and the remaining non-essential business employees covered in tier two. Naturally, once it's over, then everybody gets in. So it's, we're hoping for, we hope we never have to see this operation, but understand that you also have to get through two checkpoints before you even get to Longboat Key because the County of Manatee is gonna go ahead and have their checkpoints Sarasota is going to have theirs. We are in continuous communications with them, but if their road is blocked, no matter what we're doing on ours, you're not going to get there. We all had to go around to the Manatee side once uh, on this last hurricane. So, like I said, it was very quick, and I know you have a lot of questions for the panel, so I think Chief Desi is going to take it from here and monitor the questions. I want to first off thank the panel for everything you guys had said and appreciate it. Thank you. What I've always told people at these, at these seminars is that when you see, if you're behind the fire truck or the ambulance or a police car when you're leaving the island, you left too late. Okay, make sure you leave before. And we're the last ones off the island, so make sure you, you leave. Uh, because of time and we have some drawings to do, I have a couple questions that were placed in the box back there, so we're going to answer those questions. But keep in mind that we're the, the, count, the town is over here uh, to, to your your right. Um, so if you have questions about anything on the on the town operations, feel free to stop by. But we have one person ask a question: What if they decide to leave uh, and evacuate later on? Where do they go? Don't wait till later on. Right? We heard all these stories today. Don't leave, to, uh, leave quick. So, but if you are leaving and you're looking for a shelter, the closest shelter is going to be on Tuttle Avenue. Tuttle Elementary is where we recommend the, the, uh, the um, citizens of Longbow Key go to. That's the closest location for you to go. A big, a big um, question and something we've been working on with the town uh, for quite some time, and that is electric vehicles. What do we do with our electric vehicle if we have one, right? So, I, if, Sandra, do you mind answering that question? Yeah. Is this on? It's on. Okay. So, um, I highly recommend that you evacuate the vehicle off island at a bare minimum put it away from any structures. Um, we had electric vehicles. We learned once they come in contact with salt water and then they dry out, it, it has potential to catch on fire after the fact. So down on Sanibel Island, we had people who had electric vehicles. Their house actually survived the storm, right? The car was parked too close to the home. The, the car catches on fire. The home burns down. It burns down the next door neighbor's house as well. And because the infrastructure, the water infrastructure was decimated, there was no water for the fire department to put the water, the fire out. So short story, long story, but just make sure that you're evacuating them off, off island ideally. Um, I do know that the city of Sarasota has parking garages that are available to, that they keep open for people to um, park vehicles. I think it's supposed to be for the city you know, residents, but they're not going to check, so go ahead and maybe go there. <laughs> but just find, find a place that's away from here, um, or at least away from structures. Thank you. So there's a question about your boat. People who have a, a boat, what do we do with our boat? I can tell you the fire department and police department, we remove our boats off the island. And one reason is is that um, you know we don't want to get it damaged while it's in the 
at the dock. But the second reason is, is we would want to use it in the event that we can't get back here and we can have it on mainland with us. So when we evacuate, we take the boats with us. If you're not unable to do that, then we strongly suggest that you, you really secure that boat as best you can on the dock. Um, some, lo some boats are larger and you, you maybe move them in inland, but if you can get it out of the um, canals, that would be the best bet for you. If not, secure it as best you can with some, some ropes and tie downs uh, along, that, along that dock. So with that, I know that we're going to ask Kim to come back up. Again, I know there's some questions you may have, but due to time, we will be over here to answer them as best we can. I'm going to ask Kim to come up. She has a drawing to do. Um, and again, um, on behalf of the town, we appreciate you all being here. Just hold on one second. <laughs> wanted to thank you all for being here today and just make a couple more announcements. Uh, after the right-way drawings, and you, uh, you should have tickets out and ready to go, uh, the Longboat Key Club has uh, graciously put together some appetizers for you, so please stay around and mingle and enjoy that from them, okay? And have a very safe hurricane season, okay? Here's Darren from Rightway. Hi everyone, Darren Caldwell with Right Way Emergency Services. Um, we've already thanked the panel. I want to thank Kim and the uh, staff at the Longbow Key Chamber. They did a great deal to get all of you here. And um, they also put together these great prizes. I had a little bit of input, but they uh, went above and beyond. Um, they used one of my favorite vessels for doing these, and I'll explain that to you. But I'd like to have you commend yourselves for being here. The fact you're here tells me you want to be prepared, and that's the number one thing you need to be, okay? The counties have given you lots of great websites. You can go on. You can see the list of things that you need to get, but it's one thing to see that list. It's another thing to actually do it. So for at least five of you here, I have these great starter kits, okay? In this bucket, looks like a regular bucket here, you have your emergency flashlight. You have an emergency weather radio, you have an emergency lantern, you have a charger for your cell phone, and you have this bucket. If you have not started a kit, how many people have not started their hurricane kit? Listen, Home Depot, Lowe's, Ace, a paint store, get a bucket. Here's why I like a bucket. Put the bucket in your home so you have to see it for the next month or two until you put what you need in it. Okay, there's great list. Most of what you need, other than your food and water, will go in this bucket. If you're in your home and that storm suddenly hits and you're without electricity and suddenly now one of your windows breaks, you don't want to run around your home looking for where's my charger, where's my flashlight, where's my this. If you evacuate to a safe room, you have a bucket, this bucket goes with you. If you decide, as you should, if they say you have to evacuate to leave, this bucket doesn't take up any room in your car, right? Take it with you to whoever's home you go to. They will appreciate it very much. I say that from experience. I was here for Charlie. Um, I happen to be in Manatee County. I am 28 feet above sea level. I am not worried about water coming to me. Neither were my friends. Many came over for Charlie. The ones that brought their supplies, their food, their water, their kits, they came, they were invited back for the other storms that came. <laughs> The ones that did not, they were not invited back. I told them, I'm sorry, I am full. So it's really easy to take these things with you. All right, I'm going to give away my first one here. And get your red tickets out. I'm going to read the last four, otherwise we're going to be here a while. 6605. 6605 right here, great. Whoop, whoop. All right. Remember, that is a starter kit. You're going to want to add to that. My next winner is 6813. 6813, right here? Yay! I heard it. Where are you? All right, excellent. All right, I got another one here. 6601. 6601, going once, 
6601 going twice. Sold to no one. You are not here. Let's go for the next one. My next number is 6602. I shook these up, I promise you. 6602? You left with 6601. Let's move on. All right. 6714. 6714. Right here. Excellent. All right, are we down to, okay, we got two more. We, we're saving the fancy one for last. It's a Yeti bucket. They're a little bit more, but you can drive a truck over it. So, 6660. 6660? You were friends with 6601. You would laugh too. Okay. Here we go. 6578. 6578. Once, twice, gone. All right. 6782. 6782. Oh, great. I was about to take anything close at that point. So. All right, now. This is the Mac Daddy one, so get your tickets ready. You got the big radio, you got everything you need in here. 6838. 6838, right there? All right. Once again, as Kim said, thank you for being here. There are um, refreshments coming out. Stay around and mingle. And the county, the, the town is over there for any questions. Thanks again.